The Lord is here. Let's pray. Lord, may your word be our all. May your Holy Spirit be our teacher. And may your greater glory be our supreme concern this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. So we come to the the last of the three chapters in the second letter that Paul sent to the church of Thessalonica. And uh, he's rounding up a few things in this last chapter. And he starts this chapter by saying, um, as for other matters, I mean, last week he dealt with quite a big subject. It was a subject that um, we don't hear a lot of in the church, but uh, the Apostle Paul spent a whole chapter on it. Um, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist. We spoke about that last week. And um, we won't recap that now, we haven't got time. But he's rounding this letter off and he says, as for other matters. And he, he has a few more things to say. But as we will see in a moment, a large part of what he has to say in this last chapter is about idleness. So we, we move from the, from the Antichrist <laughs> over here in the second chapter. Um, and he is, is talking a large part of this chapter about idleness. Um, but first, Paul says, pray for us. And he's asking for prayer for two things. And, you know, what things would we think he'd ask for? Perhaps good health, protection. Normally, if somebody's traveling, um, you know, we would pray for, for the, uh, the Kirkwood and Donna and the family for protection, traveling back to the States, Aberdeen and across the country. Um, well, he does, he does ask them to pray for God's protection. He says, pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, because not, not everyone has faith. Not everyone has faith like we do, and they're against us. Verse 2. But it's not the first thing of the two that he asks for in prayer. The first thing he asks for in prayer is this, that the message of the Lord, it's the first thing he asks for, the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honoured. To spread rapidly and be honoured. And he says, just as it was with you. Verse 1. So his main concern is that as many people as possible hear the Lord's message and that as many people as possible receive it as the Lord's message and nothing else. He says that the message of the Lord be honoured, he says, just as it was with the Thessalonian believers. You know, you can give somebody gold, but it will do them no good if they don't recognise it as gold. Uh, because they won't value it, they won't look after it, and they won't keep it. So Paul's talking about pray that it will spread, but pray that people will honour the message of the Lord, recognise it for what it is, the gold that it is, if you like. And though Paul is asking them to pray for his protection against what he calls wicked and evil people, he's quick to reassure them. In the very next verse he says, the Lord is faithful. And he will strengthen. He will protect you from the evil one. And he's talking about them now. They're in a similar position in that respect. They've been persecuted too. And as we know, Jesus taught the disciples to, to pray deliver us from the evil one, the, the prayer that the Lord taught his disciples. And here we're reminded that even though we know that the Lord is faithful, we are called to pray. And Paul, who's been greatly used by God, still needs the prayers of the believers. Otherwise he wouldn't ask them to pray. He still, he still himself needs to pray. Our, our prayers and God's faithfulness go hand in hand. You know, we have confidence in God and that's why we pray. Some believers make a big mistake when they think, I have confidence in God, so therefore I don't need to pray. And they come unstuck in life for that reason, amongst others. So, so the main theme really of this chapter, which is idleness, it's about 60% of the whole chapter in terms of word count. It's quite a big chunk. And it's the last chapter, as I said, and Paul wants to finish with this instruction command. 
uh, about idleness. You know, the um, I was looking at this word command, because it comes throughout the New Testament in Scripture. Um, and I can only speak for the New Testament in this narrow way at the moment, which is because it was written in Greek. And it's a word that actually is in use today in the Greek language, barangello, as they call it today. Probably didn't pronounce it in the same way then, but it reads exactly the same. And we think of command in terms of somebody laying down the law and authority, when of course the Lord has got authority, but it's not quite the way that it reads in terms of its reality, and I'll explain why. You know, when I was growing up, my parents would often say, when they were giving us life advice, they would say, Sasparangello to the boys. They say, look, we're, I'm, I'm instructing you. It's more of an instruction. It, command, yes, but like a firm instruction. Stick to this. It's important. Sasparangello. And this is the context that Paul is writing here when he says, you know, I command you to do this. The Lord commands. And Paul here is giving life advice to the church so they can live and, and thrive. And it's about a way of life. And he says idleness, which is not working in this context, is, is not an acceptable way to live for a Christ follower. It doesn't work. It's not from the Lord. It won't have blessing. And he uses the words idle and disruptive, if we use the NIV version, twice. Verse 6 and verse 11, exactly the same words, idle and disruptive. And if we look into a little bit what that might mean, idle we understand, I've just explained that, I think we know what that means, uh, not working. But there's also something in the, in the Greek which means kind of curious, uh, not steady. There's, the Greek also has got an, uh, an association of being everywhere and nowhere, if you know what I mean. Um, not settled. The dictionary definition of idleness is lazy, a state of inaction. And yet, we know from Scripture that, uh, as James says, faith by itself, without action, is dead. We need action. And we need that in the Christian life. And then as Diane read, he says, these people, they're not, they're not busy. They're, they're busy bodies. They're, they're everywhere in other people's affairs, etc. So, um, we can form whatever picture we, we, the, the Lord brings to mind. This is the scripture. And the Lord, no doubt, will speak to you and to me about what that might look like for us today. But Paul says in verse 6, in the name of the Lord Jesus, he says, we command you. And verse 12, such people, and this is addressing to the people, he says, such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, with the command, in verse 6 and verse 12, he says, in the Lord Jesus. And what is Paul commanding? In verse 6, he's instructing the believers, I command you, he says, to keep away from believers who are idle and disruptive and who do not live according to the teaching you received from us. This is a strong thing to say to a church, isn't it? To actually keep away from some believers. Paul calls them believers. He actually says, some believers. So they are believers. They do have a faith in Christ. But in this area of life, they're not following Christ. And Paul says again in verse 14, he says... Don't associate with them. It's a strong thing to us to hear. He says, take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter. He's reinforcing the instruction. So Paul gives strong instruction to the church in how to treat believers that are idle. But he also has a direct instruction for those idle believers themselves. He says, such people we command and urge you in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down. And he says, and to earn the food they eat. You know, in scripture, whenever Paul gives an instruction, when he says, in the Lord Jesus Christ, it means that Paul isn't just saying, this is what I think as the Apostle Paul. He's saying that this instruction is from the Lord. It's from the highest authority. 
It's an instruction that therefore needs to be taken very seriously by the believers. In 1 Corinthians, for example, 7, 12, he makes a distinction. It's not the Lord saying this. He says, I say this, he says, not the Lord. I say this, not the Lord, he says in 1 Corinthians. But here he's saying, in the Lord Jesus, twice. It's from the Lord. However, we also need to be careful to understand what the, the Apostle Paul is saying here. On the one hand, we have keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and do not associate with them. But on the other hand, Paul says, verse 15, don't regard them as an enemy. But those people, aren't they going to wonder, where's the love for me gone in this church? Everyone seems to have turned against me. It's, it's a fair point, isn't it? And the answer first comes in verse 14, where Paul says, don't associate with them in order that, is the reason, in order that they may feel ashamed. In other words, there is a point to not associating with those that are idle and disruptive and keeping away from them. And the point is to help them realise this is not how we live in this Christian community. And that they, he says, may feel ashamed and hopefully change their lifestyle. Each person has to make their own decisions on this, don't they? And then in verse 15 he says, don't regard them as an enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. They're still part of the family. But the warning's important. These are believers that we're talking about, and they're part of the family of God. They're not enemies of God's people. But they are to be warned that they're not, they're not walking the walk. That's what Paul is saying to the Thessalonian church. And they are to be warned in love. There's got to be a love behind it. Don't we know the difference between a warning from someone who doesn't love you? And there's someone who actually loves you. You know their hearts for you. They know that they would, they would do so much for you. They're for you. The motive is to help them. And those believers will not be living a useful and productive life in God if they continue to be, quote, idle and disruptive. They won't represent the Lord well, nor the church. And nor will they feel good about themselves either. It will not be a, a satisfying or fulfilling existence if they carry on living like that. And you know when you love somebody, especially in your own family, you warn them. If it's clear they're going in the wrong direction. And it's in that context that Paul is writing. It's family. If you care about them, you warn them. And he says, we... We weren't idle when we were with you, he says in verse 7. And the Apostle Paul with Silvanus and, and Timothy, they set an example which Paul expected the Thessalonian believers to follow. It was not, do as I preach, but not as I do. After all, it was Paul, Silvanus and Timothy that actually taught them, quote, he says, according to the teaching you received from us, verse 6. So they're the ones teaching it. So they, they also practiced it. But we lose respect, don't we, for people? Especially leaders that teach one thing, but do another. Leaders whose words don't match their actions. And the world is, is very good at that, but it should not be found among church leaders or among the church at all. And of course, leaders will not be perfect in everything they do. We understand that. But their example should be worth following. And Paul, Silvanus and Timothy, they were living out what they were preaching. And the Thessalonian believers, they saw it. They saw it. And that's why Paul can say, you yourselves know, he says, they were together. You yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, he says in verse 7. Paul is saying, you saw us. You know it's the right way to be. He says, we weren't idle when we were with you. Paul is reminding them, he says, you didn't see us sitting around and not doing anything. We were working among you. And in verse 8, he says, 
nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. Now, you know, if I come round your house with Julie and you offer some hospitality, I probably won't pull out my wallet and pay you for what, uh, for what you've given us to eat. You'd think it was odd. You might even, even feel offended by such a thing if I was to do that. But we know that Paul, Silvanus and Timothy had stayed with the Thessalonians for three weeks at least from Acts chapter 17, if you want to look at that. Three weeks at least. And as visitors, they wanted to show what sort of people that they are. Or they were, that, that they weren't lazy. So that no one, no one could point fingers. Don't forget, they didn't know them very well. No one could point fingers at them. And, and being a good example in this area of paying their way helped make people listen to the message about the Lord that they served. And the Lord Jesus was represented well as a result. So the three of them made sure that they were not a burden to the Thessalonians that they were staying with. He says so that we would not be a burden to any of you. In fact, Paul says, we worked night and day, labouring and toiling. Why? So that we would not be a burden to any of you. Verse 8. So Paul, Silvanus and Timothy turn up at Thessalonica where they're, they're not known particularly and they work whatever jobs they can, whatever hours they can, whatever they can get, so that no one could accuse them of taking advantage of the local people there. No one could say these men turned up and were after our money, for example. No. There's words that we have like grifter or freeloaders and things like that. No one could accuse them of anything like that. It meant that people could focus on the message of the gospel that they were speaking. The Lord Jesus, this is the message, the Lord Jesus had come, lived among us, the visible image of the invisible God. Why? So that whoever believed and trusted in him could have their sins forgiven, receive the Holy Spirit, the power to live for him, could have the power of sin broken in their lives, the destructive and ungodly patterns of behaviour ended and the offer of a new life being born again, no longer living in their own goodness, but in the goodness, the righteousness of God. The message that anyone who believed in Christ also received God the Father and the right to become adopted sons and daughters of the Most High God. No longer living in condemnation, no longer living in defeat, trying to earn their own goodness, but trusting in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ so that the weight of our wrongdoing could be lifted. The penalty cancelled so that people, God's people could actually say in the words of the hymn, in fact, I don't mind being embarrassed, I'm going to sing it. It says, it says a joy that knows no limit, a lightness in my spirit, here in the grace of God I stand. Yeah, God's people can say, a joy that knows no limit, a lightness in my spirit. Here in the grace of God I stand. Yes, Paul wanted the Thessalonians to know God's grace. And he didn't want anything to get in the way of that message. So they worked in whatever jobs, whatever hours they could in order to pay their way. What a difference compared to some of the high profile figures today that we see and hear speaking in the name of Christ who always seem to be asking for money and who live a fabulously wealthy lifestyle and give the Lord and the church a bad name. You know, a friend I knew, this was about 20 years ago, she went out for an evening meal with a group of people from work and she was careful with what she could afford. She had a budget uh, to spend on this meal. She chose carefully from the menu. <laughs> but when the group bill came, uh, they just simply divided it by the number of people that were there, which is a common thing, I understand. But it turns out that she was expected to pay more than twice what she'd budgeted for. Thankfully, she had a credit card with her, and she didn't make a fuss. And it seems that some people in the group had ordered far, far more than the rest, 
starters, desserts and drinks, and yet expected other people to pay for them. And Paul and his companions, they made sure no one could say that about them when they visited for three weeks. Brothers and sisters, if we want to have influence in this life, we need to lead by example. Words are not enough. Verse 7, Paul says, follow our example. Verse 9, to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. And he says, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who's unwilling to work shall not eat. Verse 10. And he's given them a principle of godly living. We need to be willing to work, to provide for ourselves. There were some exceptions, of course, there still are today. Those who were unable to unable, not unwilling, unable to work. There were individuals by the roadside with disabilities, for example. We think of blind Bartimaeus. We think of all sorts of people that feature in the New Testament who had no choice but needed to depend on other people to give them food and some financial support, of course. And Scripture calls God's people to look out for, to support the weak, to support the vulnerable, the defenseless, the voiceless. But Paul has given the Thessalonian church a rule. The one who's unwilling, this is his words, the one who's unwilling to work shall not eat. But Paul also wants to make clear that they, as God's workers, if you like, in the Lord, he wants to make clear that they actually had the right to receive help with provisions, but they decided, and Paul decided at that time, to pay their own way for the reasons that we've already covered. So, for example, he says here, uh, he says, we did this not because we don't have the right to such help. He says, we did this not because we don't have the right, but he says, we did this in order to, to be a model for you to imitate. Why did they have the right to such help? And the answer is that they were already working to provide for the spiritual needs of the Thessalonian believers through preaching and teaching them, feeding them with God's word. And in another passage in scripture, when Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 4 to 15, Paul touches upon the same theme again. He says, don't we have the right to food and drink, he says? Who plants a vineyard, he says, and does not eat its grapes? Who tends a flock? And does not drink the milk, he says. Whoever ploughs and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. He says, if we've sown spiritual seed among you, bearing in mind he's right to another church now, but the principle is still here. If we've sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? He says, but we did not use this right. He has the right, but we didn't use this right. On the contrary, he said, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. He says, don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple? And that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar. And he says, in the same way, he says, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But then he finishes that passage and he says, for the second time, but I have not used any of these rights. No, he's saying we put up with anything, anything rather than put any obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ and and you receiving it. He said, even if some people didn't see his preaching of the gospel as worth supporting, it wasn't going to stop the Apostle Paul from preaching and teaching. And then, as we come to the end of the letter, we talked last week about fake news. People thought they'd heard something from Paul. Paul says, no, it wasn't from me. Whatever you heard, 
I didn't write it, I didn't say it, I didn't prophesy it. Remember? We talked about that. So, here, he finishes the letter, he says, I, Paul, as Diane read, write this greeting in my own hand. It's the distinguishing mark in all of my letters. This is how I write, he says. So if you want to know who I am, this is what it looks like. This is my handwriting. There's no fake here. If you want to check against something that's not from me, this is how I write. I write this greeting in my own hand. In other words, if you want to know if something's genuinely from me, this is what it looks like. This is my handwriting. And it's one of the main reasons that the Apostle Paul is writing, because the believers had heard this teaching that was supposedly meant to be from Paul, but it wasn't. Things he had never said about the second coming, if you remember. And for us today, we need to be able to fact check anything that we're told God is supposed to have said. Anything we're told that supposedly the church believes. And there's a lot of nonsense, unfortunately. We need to fact check it with God's word. There's a few things that have come to my mind recently uh, because of, you know, uh, dad and funeral, etc. But the Bible says nothing about praying to saints. The Bible says nothing about praying to Mary. The Bible says nothing about having priests. The Lord Jesus is our great high priest. We have church leaders, we have pastors, but we don't have priests. We don't have a, an in-between ourselves and the Lord. So we fact-check everything. There might be other things that you hear and you think, does the Bible really say that? And the Bereans were, were commended because they actually went back to their scriptures and, and double-checked. We need to double-check. I'm going to finish with uh, the prayer that Paul prays for the Thessalonian church. And he says, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you, he says. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's pray. Our oh, Father God, we, Lord, we find time and time again in Scripture, Lord, that your word speaks in such plain language. Sometimes we wince. It speaks so directly to us. But Lord, help us to take it to heart. Help us to be able to sift it and apply it well. And especially, Lord, in church where no one is an enemy. But Lord, help us to encourage each other, warn each other, Lord of a godly way of living, as you've shown us in your word. Thank you, Lord, that the Apostle Paul was clear. He said, it's, it's not from himself. He says, I urge you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Twice he said that, Father. We thank you, Lord, for it becoming so clear. Thank you, Lord, for your word that is so rich, not just about the big theology themes and doctrines, Lord, but even to practical living. Thank you, Father, for your word. Lord, help us to apply it, not in a judgmental way, Father, but in a loving way, with your heart, a loving Father's heart. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.